mostly I tell them not to invest in the country, but I actually, th there are always opportunities where you can actually make money on a one-off basis. But as a country, India is an utter disaster. It will fall apart. Hi, Giant. How you doing? Very well, Andy. Thanks for having me again. Thanks for uh, joining me. We again, there's a lot of last time we've talked. There's we, we talked about chaos in in the in the marketplace as well as culturally and going on in the world, and it seems to really be hitting right now. And we see that with one of our favorite assets, gold, really, and silver now really breaking out of a range. Let's talk a little bit about that, your perspective on why that's breaking out right now, and then we'll go into the other things. So give me your 30,000 foot view now on gold and, and then silver. Gold pricing did catch me by surprise for sure. I have been anticipating increase in gold price for the last two, three years because we had a very high inflation rate and we had we continue to have a negative real interest rate in virtually all currencies. So for my logical, fundamentally driven mind, gold price had to go up. It did not go up for three years. Now it suddenly did go up within, within a period of uh, a month. So it did catch me by surprise. I'm very happy it went up, but I'm also unhappy that it also is a reflection of increasing chaos in the world. The Ukrainian-Russian problem refuses to get solved. The Palestinian, Gaza, and Israeli problem refuses to uh, get resolved. And now we have a new element in this uh, whole uh, war project, which is Iran. And Israel is going to retaliate. And this will create a, could, could create all kinds of troubles in the, in the future. I'm, I'm very happy Andy, that I started paying attention to East Asia early enough, and I'm currently in Tokyo. I, I enjoy being in East Asia. It is an area that has managed to segregate itself out of these big chaoses. So, so that's where I see it. I'm very happy, but I'm also unhappy about the gold price. It's, it's, this is something that we have been talking about for many years, and you know, unfortunately, that means transfer of wealth from people who don't own hard money to those who own hard money. But this is the way the world works. Right. So well, about chaos here, do you think this drive in the gold price has been, and silver price now, is primarily been drive, driven by war and the threat of war, specifically in the Middle East and then previously Russia and Ukraine? Or do you think this is an indicator of what's going on with money printing and the Fed? Uh, well, I don't know what happened over the last one month. I, I have tried to understand it. I can't really wrap my head around what actually happened over the last one month. What was behind a sudden increase in gold price? Now, gold price should have gone up. Now, what made it happen, what triggered it is something I failed to understand. But clearly, uh, you see, uh, Ukraine has been destroyed. It was, you know, from whatever I have understood, it was a bad war. It gains Ukraine nothing. It has destroyed their societies. So hundreds of thousands of men, young men have died, which means that family structure in Ukraine will worsen. You know, the same thing happened with Europe when in the First and Second World War, so many men died. Family structures fall apart. Women have to go around searching for men. They become desperate. It really leads to chaos in the society. So we have destroyed Ukraine. We have harmed uh, Russia. We have taken China and Russia away from the Western uh, sphere of influence completely. And... So we have achieved nothing. And now we have a new problem, which is the Gaza problem. And uh, Iran added to that. I don't know, fully understand uh, why gold price suddenly went up. Some people say it's because the federal banks around the world were suddenly buying gold. But that doesn't sound too logical to me. They won't all at once start going to the, to the, to the 
market to start buying gold. So I, I, I hope I, we eventually find out. But having said all that, gold price had to go up because it hadn't kept track of the inflation that we had faced. So on inflation adjusted basis, gold price had to go up. Making gold is very expensive. It has become very expensive. So uh, the profit margins were getting hugely compressed. So this gold price increase is going to lead to an increase of profitability in gold mines. So, you know, overall, it's, it's, it, it is something that had to happen. Why it suddenly happened it still amazes me. Yeah, I think that's a really good answer because I think you certainly could point point the finger to what's going on in global politics, for lack of a better word, but that's not maybe not necessarily true. You could certainly point the finger at central bank buying, but that might not necessarily be true either. I think it's one of those things not to overthink it other than what you just said, it had to go up. And things, everything eventually sooner or later returns to its mean, right? And it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it just seems like gold and now silver is just really going to its, to its mean. Well, but at the same time, in the short term, the, you know, the mean, what you mean by mean is higher price here. And gold has to go to its inflation adjusted higher right. price. But in the short term, I fear that gold price can face correction. So this is not really the time I'm going to chase either gold or silver. You know, this is, this is really important to buy low and sell high. This is what one of the main pillars of successful trading. So people start going into feeding frenzy at these kind of times when things have started to move up. And that is really the time when I start selling. That's what makes me the most profit. Yeah. No, I would agree. I would be careful. I'd be very careful here to adding any positions until you get some kind of significant correction. That just seems, well, that always happens is people that chase are usually the ones that suffer the most. So let's talk about, again, all of this chaos here, what's going on, if we can game this out. And I don't mean game as a fun game, but just thinking of the probabilities and the possibilities. So let's take, Let's take, start with Russia and Ukraine. Russia just, it seems like, well, I, I, I want to, I don't, I'm paraphrasing. I just brought, read an article the other day where they just said, well, we've completely taken control of the country now. And now this is settled on, or will be settled on our terms. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but what's your prognosis of what's going to happen with, with all of that? Well, you know, Andy, the, the, the sorry thing is that Ukrainians are suffering the most across the country. They are suffering economically. There are deaths all over the place. Uh, Russia has been able to dominate. Russia gets support from China. The Western countries are probably going to lose patience with Ukraine because their focus is going to shift to uh, Gaza and Iran. So, you know, Ukraine got into trouble for no good reason. And I, I really think that the Western countries should have avoided trying to expand NATO to Ukraine. And sure. that triggered all the problems. So it's hard to take a side. I am I'm not a lover or I, I don't, don't love yeah. Putin. It's, 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 I don't like Putin, but I don't like Ukrainian Zelensky either. I think he's, uh, you know, he's a comedian and he should have stayed as a comedian. He has created a horror show by becoming, giving up his comedian job. But that's what happens in politics. You, you, take, you take on something that you're not competent to deliver on. Right. So, you know, and this is an unending, you know, it's an ego issue now. Putin doesn't want to give up because if he gives up, uh, his life will go away. He will, you know, uh, Russians will revolt. You and Zelensky can no longer give up because people will ask, what did uh, these 100,000, 200,000 or whatever number of people who died, died for? All these women have flooded into Western Europe and North America. What are these women going to do? They, these women have become, you know, they have, they have no families, no, no anchors in their lives. So 
these people will all complain, what did we fight all this war for? So th this is not an, e it's easy to start a war. It's very difficult to end it. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's a wise, wise way to look at it. Well, let's talk about the Middle Eastern conflict now. It started with, again, Palestine and Israel. Now it's being bled over now with Iran and Israel, and that seems to be escalating very dangerously. And Israel just came out to say that the past 24 hours or 48 hours was an act of war. So it looks like they're going to take it to the next level. How does this play out, if you would, and what are the scenarios that you're looking at as an investor and then just as a, as a human being? Well, as an investor, clearly oil price is something I'm going to watch for. This can have a huge influence on, on the oil price if, because Israel will retaliate. Israel is not a country that will sit quietly on this. It will go and retaliate and it will retaliate hard. So, right. so that's indeed going to happen. I don't know if other countries, how, what other countries will join in. I, I think from what I have seen, Saudi Arabia and UAE and Qatar and uh, Bahrain and Oman, they, they increasingly want to probably want to take the course of peaceful existence. And they are becoming, from what I see, increasingly westernized. So. I don't know if this will expand or not, but it will. It can certainly have an effect on, on, on the oil price. It, you know, but at the same time, Iran is a big country. They have a big uh, capability to create chaos, and they have, you know, taking over, hijacking a ship was uh, creating chaos, which is out from what I understand outside the. The code of conduct of international trade. Last time we talked, you're very bullish on Asia. And it's also, you mentioned off camera that it, there's a lot of sense of security there in Asia, and it seems to segregate itself in the best way from the rest of the world. Talk to me about that, Asia, specifically where you're at. And you're looking for opportunities over there. Well, uh, Andy, one of the big mistakes I think the U.S. ever did what to, was to get involved in the affairs of other countries, other societies which are culturally very different. It, the United States has been, you know, it, it was a force behind decolonizing the world. The world would have been a much better place had French and uh, British continued to colonize the world. It was too early to decolonize these countries, and it was probably never wise to decolonize them in the first place. Uh, democracy does not always work for everyone. I don't think it works for the U.S. either. Uh, it is now leading to the worst aspect of democracy, even within the United States and Canada now. So democracy doesn't work at all. What... East Asia has done a good job with is that they don't necessarily like to interfere in affairs of uh, other countries. And that is true with uh, China, that is true with Japan, that's true with Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan. They want to uh, deliver on what they are given the job of, which is to look at their internal affairs. Um, also, these countries have adamantly stayed homogeneous. Um, uh, now, there are a lot of uh, foreign workers in uh, many of these countries, particularly Hong Kong and Singapore, but they never give out uh, permanent residency, let alone uh, citizenship to foreigners. You can be living in these countries for three generations and still might never receive permanent residencies of these countries. So. You know, they have stayed homogeneous, which means that socially there is less strife. There's no victim class within these societies. And if there's no victim class, then there is that uh, expectation of free money, reparations, that the welfare checks does not exist much. That has also kept their honor culture intact. You look, you go around Tokyo, look at the beggars. They have this shy kind of existence. They, they, begging is not something, you know, they, 
in Tokyo, in, in some, well, the only place I can see beggars are in, uh, in a couple of these countries in East Asia. You don't see them in China, Singapore, or Hong Kong. But where you see beggars, there's an honor culture. You're not supposed to be begging. And there is never going to be a beggar asking you for a free cigarette. That does not happen in these countries. So there's a, a still you know, a huge honor culture. You go to any of these countries and you see people who are 70, 75, or probably even 80 years old, working, uh, cleaning tables or washing dishes. Uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, honorable existence in life. If you failed to save enough and if you want to work, then you go out and work. So I think that has kept stability in the society, but also because there's no activist victim class in East Asia, the, 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 you don't see protests in these countries. Uh, Firstly, they don't like protests anyway, which I'm all in favor of. But also, people, if you don't have, if you don't think you are a victim class, you don't protest, which saves so much energy and uh, welfare checks. Yeah, you can go to work with all of that energy, right? So, let, you know, I was on your Twitter page, and that just what you just said, just you're know, very critical, if you would, of India, where, where you've come from, and. The modern narrative or the narrative, I don't want to say the modern narrative, but the recent narrative has been very pro-India in the sense of investing in India. And you don't, you don't see that. And then you made a comment, or I don't want to say, well, yeah, you made a comment about how the largest, the largest immigration population in Canada right now and in the U.S. is from India. So what exactly does that mean as far as what you just said about cultural stability, about working, what does that mean to Canada? And what does that mean, or do you see it to the here in the US? So uh, the Western population today is a victim of propaganda being conducted by Western governments. Western governments have become anti-China and they do become anti-China, they want to use India as a ploy, but they also, uh, to have India on their side, they want to manipulate their own citizens into thinking that India is the next China. Now, India is not the next China, and I fully understand China might be a problem for the West, but that does not mean that India is your friend. Now, Andy, remember, I'm an analyst. I have to weigh issues and many things properly. Otherwise, I fail in my conclusions. Um, and I tell you this thing that currently the world is afraid of Islamists in Europe, and they should be. The is Islamic fanaticism is horrible, and it will have a grave consequences for Europe. Uh, Europe should have stopped immigration from African countries and Muslim countries a long, long time back. So they have gone on a suicidal mission by doing so, by continuing to bring in these people. But I tell you this thing that once the average Indians ha Indian has made his presence felt in the West, what happened, what is happening with Islamists will feel like a walk in the park for you. The problem is that Indian society has no honor culture, it has no value structure, it has no discipline, it has no moral fabric, it is extraordinarily dysfunctional, or I would say unfunctional, and you are going to import all that wild, feral elements into your society by bringing in so many people from India. India is, an average India is no, Indian is no different from a sub-Saharan African. Now, you don't get as many sub-Saharan African yet in the Western society because there's a Sahara desert in between. Flying out of sub-Saharan Africa is not that easy. What you have most largely got is Africans from North Africa. Uh, but once you get people who have had no, uh, no 
marination, no, 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 who haven't been marinated in sophisticated cultures, which has been the case with India and Sub-Saharan Africa, those people will create massive social chaos in the West. So, you know, right now it looks like as if uh, Indians are the most intelligent people in the United States because some of the top CEOs in the United States are Indians. And Indian as a group make the most money in the United States. But remember, Andy, that is still just over $100,000 a year. Now, $100,000 a year is not a huge amount of money. The only thing is that just because most of the Indians who came to the U.S. came over the last two or three decades, happened to be either engineers, scientists, or doctors, and as a result, make more than average wages, end up become, making more money than an average American, does not mean that he also brings in better than average cultural values. He brings in horrible cultural values, and that is what is going to be destructive for the West, Australia, uh, the United States, and Canada. So you think that they'll assimilate to Western culture? I'm sorry, say that again, Andy. You... Yeah, no problem. So you don't think things with Indian, Indian immigrants will assimilate into Western culture, meaning into... Western values and that sort of thing. No. no, an average Indian will not assimilate into the Western society. And India itself is a, a, is falling apart. It's, it's a very dysfunctional society. Nothing works in that country. Everyone, every bureaucrat, every single bureaucrat and politician you ever come across, and I continue to engage with India, is after bribes and connections. That's the only thing that runs. The, the corruption bribe is the only thing that flows into the veins of that country. So it's a very un dysfunctional society. And you are bringing in mindsets which lead to an, a dysfunctional society into the Western society. And now that you have brought in so many people, you have also brought in family connections, which mean that once uh, India become more and more chaotic, more and more people using family connections will keep on moving to the Western society. Now, heterogeneous societies simply do not work. Uh, th there's no heterogeneous society in the world that works well. Uh, so, uh, and we should have understood this properly. But Canada, which was, you know, when I moved to Canada, which was when it was truly a very peaceful society 20 years back, there was no, no news coming out of Canada. Now you every day hear about shooting or stabbings or fights. These things did not happen in Canada. Now they are in, happening more and more. Interesting. So I guess bringing us all around, then what is one person to do or what is an investor to do? And again, it sounds to me like keep the course of acquiring Commodities or hard money, i.e. precious metals, on pullbacks, if you would. Be selective in choosing certain commodity stocks, if you would. But then also have a focus on Southeast Asia or East Asia. Is that what an investor should be doing? I think you should be. You should be investing contrary to what the U.S. government is telling you. You should be paying attention to China. China will continue to be China. There is no next China. It's the powerhouse of the world. It's the manufacturing powerhouse house of the world. And it is, it's, a, it's a country that continues to improve. Now, China is facing some problems, economic problems right now. Uh, but we all face, uh, or every country faces that problem. And there's a concept called overheating in economics anyway. After three decades of uh, 8 to 10 or 12% growth, uh, China had to get overheated. Uh, they are uh, making corrections and government is not interfering as much as a Western government would have interfered in, in a situation like this. The government of China is not interfering in the property market much, which is leading to a chaos in the property market. But that's actually a very capitalistic way of working, which is that you let market get punished for its errors. So I quite like Asian, East Asian countries, not Indian subcontinent countries, but Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, 
these are good countries. This is where I like to keep a big chunk of my money. And I like to invest in these countries. And also, because the world is so enamored with India right now, and clearly they are not sending their money to India, but th this is just the romanticism about India, which is leading to a negative image of China, which continues to lead to a negative out outcome in the Chinese stock market, means that you can actually invest in China through Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And also in Singapore and Japan, these are good countries to invest in, protect your wealth. Now, gold, of course, you know, you, you can only own so much of gold because at the end of the day, it's a non-yielding asset. So this is something which is uh, you have with you as if you keep cash with you. 5, 10, 15 percent of your net worth in uh, gold or silver is perfectly legitimate. But uh, I like to invest the rest of my money in productive investments. Yeah, okay, so I have three questions for you. Two pertain to Asia. Does the population concern, is that concerning to you both in China as well as, I want to say, Japan and Korea, meaning they're not having, the population isn't growing from what I understand. Is I, it is it, it is a concern. It's a concern for the whole of the rich world. It is indeed a concern. You, when I drive around Japan, I see villages which have completely disappeared. People have completely left. They are empty villages. Houses are falling into disrepair. Uh, and you might see a few old people around. Young people have left for uh, bigger cities. So unfortunately, that is a problem with uh, Japan, Korea, and it is uh, increasingly a problem with China. It is a big problem in Singapore and Hong Kong as well. Uh, but don't fool yourself into thinking that that is not a problem in the Western world. The exact problem exists in the Western world as well. The only thing is that you are fooling yourself by bringing in so many outsiders, thinking that you are making up for a reduction of native population by bringing in those people who are not going to be pr productive, a contributor to your society. These people are, they, they depend on welfare checks. They are not bringing in leadership skills. They are not bringing in cultural values. And as I said earlier, Canada was just a quiet, nice, peaceful country 20 years back when I moved in. Now you hear about crime all over Canada. A few months back, there was pitched battles between two groups of Eritreans in Alberta. Now, this is something unthought of, was unthought of in Canada 20 years back. There were no such ghettos in Canada. So how is fooling yourself by making up for population decline among the native, among the original inhabitants by bringing in so many useless people from outside going to help you out? Now, population decline is, could be an issue. But that is certainly something we should address separately. But also, even if uh, in bringing in people from outside helped you out, you're only kicking the can down the road because at the end of the day, people who come in also have fewer children. So population decline will eventually kick in, kick in anyway. Now, what I see in a lot of these countries is in East Asian countries is that the, the, the technology is taking over functions of population decline and they can bring in immigrants and they bring in immigrants, but on short term visas, they do not get give permanent residencies or citizenships to those people. And if nothing else, that's what the Western countries should do. If they have to bring in people, they can continue to test that. But at, at the very least, stop giving out your pass, uh, passports and permanent residencies so easily. Particularly, I would such, uh, say that to countries like Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, who give out their passports after three years of uh, residency in their countries. Got it. So it leads me to really to two questions to wrap up. 
Asia, Southeast Asia, correct me if I'm wrong, or East Asia, correct me if I'm wrong, they're starved for natural resources. Is that a concern as well? Because they're going to have to, I know, like, for example, Japan and even China, they're going to have, they import everything for all of the natural resources and then they export technology. Is that not correct? Um, not necessarily. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, the value of natural resources is uh, often exaggerated in the minds of uh, people. Uh, what the value today in today's technological age is human resources. Um, Singapore has no natural resources. Hong Kong has no natural resources. They right. do extremely well. Japan has actually natural resources, but they don't care to exploit them. They are dependent on their human resources. There are always some countries that are open from where they could bring in commodities. Commodities are so fungible that they flow from, you know, you can stop uh, certain path based for flow of commodities, but they start flowing from different directions. Imagine, you know, remember this thing when we started, stopped importing oil from Russia in the Western world. It increased the oil price for a while, but it brought the oil price down again because oil started flowing through different pipelines. And the same thing happens with commodities. Even China can ban export of certain commodities, but those commodities will flow through different channels. So I, I'm not so worried about commodities export, but also China is actually a huge supplier of commodities. They, it's just that they consume most of the commodities in-house rather than export those. Right. And I just thought of this. What is your opinion on uranium? Because... It looks like Japan is starting to open back up its uranium, uranium, as well as China. They're starting to build more uranium plants. Do you have um, a view I, on uranium? Go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 you know, there are only a few commodities that I have a view on, Andy. I, I prefer to take a position that commodities are called commodities for a reason. They are fungible. They are, they exist so much in bulk that there is a futures market. There are options market. There's so many demand and supplier interactions happening in very intricate ways into the future that I consider the spot and future prices to be the final prices. I don't try to speculate on commodities, but I try to, but I have views on three commodities. One is uranium, one is coal, and one is gold. And let me very briefly respond to Please. all those three if you want me to. Please. Firstly, Uranium is an exaggerated commodity. Constructing a uranium generate, uh, electricity generating plant is extremely expensive. Now, the cost of making electricity from every pound of uranium is very cheap, but then there is something called cost of capital, which is the cost cap capital that goes into constructing the uranium-based electricity generating plants. Uh, which means that the end product is actually not as cheap as what people who believe in uranium like to claim. The second problem with uranium is that you have to, through legislative authority, reduce the uh, capability of local people to make claims on uranium companies if something goes wrong. Otherwise, uranium plants are too expensive because of the insurance requirements. So uranium in the current state is not the best way, the cheap, the, 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 is not a cheap way to make electricity. Uh, it is also claimed that a lot more and more uranium plants are in construction. Look at the charts. Look at the charts of how much electricity is produced by electricity, uranium-based electricity generating plants and go 20, 30, 50 years on that it has actually dropped as a percentage over, a pe over this period of time. And in fact, this, the construction of uranium plants takes such a long time that they are more and more in construction, but they are forever in construction. So that does not mean that they actually get, start producing electricity the way many people like to think they do. So I'm not so excited about uranium now, that does not mean I'm, I don't invest in uranium uh, mining companies. I do actually, one of my larger position is currently a uranium exploration company. 
I can't name it for a reason, but I am in very well positioned in uranium. But that is based on simple valuation, which is that even if uranium price fell by another 20%, I would still be well positioned to make money from that, my investment. Uh, so uh, I'm not so excited about uranium. The second thing is coal. Uh, I am very excited about coal uh, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, that despite that I don't like to speculate on commodities, coal has been thrown away by the fund managers and bank and the banking industry. They don't want to invest in coal companies because they think it's unethical to invest in coal companies. Now, hypocritically, these empty suits do not think that it's unethical to use electricity generated by coal companies, but that's a different matter. These are Ivy League educated people. How they create this thinking in their minds, I don't really fully understand. I'm uh, maybe not capable of. But I um, as, a, I, as a result of their policy, which is not to invest in coal companies, uh, coal companies have become extremely cheap and extremely cash rich. Coal companies are sitting on one, two, three billion dollars in cash because they know that they have to self-finance for every project. So they are well cashed up and they are generating a humongous amount of cash for me. So coal, com coal is very good. Gold is a third thing. As I said earlier, I am not going to chase gold at this moment. And I'm in fact going to book my profits at, at the current time just because gold price has gone up too too, too high too quickly. But at the same time, gold has a future because the world is going to become very chaotic. The world is becoming more and more chaotic for one prime reason, and which is that Pax Americana is coming to a close. And there's no one else to take over that place. And that will bring a massive amount of chaos. The fiat currency system is, create, is creating monetary chaos in the for people and for the for a for an average guy who does not know how to invest in the stock market or property market or who does not understand how the world works gold and silver becomes extremely important ways to preserve his cash and that is why i think gold and silver will do better in the future although i would not chase the uh, go, either of those at the current price the last question, is there anything or any situa situation that would make you want to invest in India again? Any kind of pullback in the stock market or change in politics or, yeah, anything? Well, I, so, I all, so I get involved in consulting companies on investing in India. Mostly, I tell them not to invest in the country, but I actually... There are always opportunities where you can actually make money on a one-off basis. But as a country, India is an utter disaster. It will fall apart. And you, the only thing you should think about India is for the worries it will create for you in the future. I, am, I like to keep minimal amount of my money in India because they tax me 33% of all interest I make on nominal interest. So I want to keep minimal amount of money in that country. It's a true hellhole, Andy. Anyone who has a romantic view of India, I really, really advise that person to do one thing. Buy an economy class ticket. Don't buy a first class ticket. Buy an economy class ticket. Fly over to Mumbai and Delhi. Don't arrange for a taxi to pick you up from, from your hotel. Just stay in a three-star hotel. Organize a taxi, which you, which I do even when I go to Sub-Saharan Africa. Organize your taxi when you arrive and go to a, just an average hotel. Spend two days and then you will realize very, very quickly what you are talking about. The problem is, Andy, that these people fly first class. They, they get taken around the country that they only get this uh, superficial uh, uh, understanding of the country, the way the other party wants to portray to you. So go and just walk the, walk, walk the streets for a few days and you will very quickly understand the skill levels of that country because there are no skill levels. I can't find a plumber or electrician in that country. 
there is no moral fabric in that country. People don't honor their contract. The food makes you sick. There are problems after problems in that country. I laugh just because it's absurd. Yeah, I would never want to do that. So, well, well, you I... should do it. You should do it, Andy. Every <laughs> every male should do it because you can never understand these words unless you have spent some time in India. I would still advise a female not to do it by herself, but uh, a male should actually go and walk the, the, the streets of India for a, for a few days to understand how bad things can get. Because those days are coming for the, for the, you know, worst things are coming for the Western society very soon because they have brought in people who uh, made their homelands um, uh, hell holes. Yeah. Well, I'll go with you. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. If uh, people want to use your services and I'll link to all of this, how do they get in touch with you or, yeah, tell us about yourself. Well, the best thing to contact Contact me through as my website, jayantpandari.com. There's a contact page there and also my writings and other things go on that website as well. Got it. Now, uh, I found you on Twitter, so I'll put, a, I'll put your Twitter, your Twitter handle also, or X handle as well in the show notes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time together as always. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Andy. Keep up.